Botswana's long-time diamond deal with De Beers is under threat. Two Kenya women MPs were booted out of parliament yesterday for different reasons. A pair of Uganda lawmakers get bill after 17 months without trial. The fact that for more than one and a half years, they've not been able to piece together evidence to have them tried. For me, it speaks to the fact that um, the charges were probably politically motivated. And Ethiopia's Oromo and Amhara actors promote traditional conflict resolution. Those stories plus our Black History Month facts of today are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Supporters of two Ugandan opposition lawmakers have welcomed their release on bail after being held in prison on murder charges for 17 months. The opposition National Unity Platform says the charges were intended to weaken government critics, which authorities deny. The two lawmakers were repeatedly denied bail and no trial date has been set. Halima Athumani reports from Kampala, Uganda. A temporary relief is what opposition leaders are calling the release Monday night of two legislators allied with the opposition national unity platform led by Bobby Wine. Despite several bail applications by lawyers in recent months, the prosecutor blocked the request on the grounds the legislators would interfere with the investigations. The legislators, Alan Sewanyana and Mohamed Sejirinya, were incarcerated for 17 months on charges including murder, attempted murder and aiding and abetting terrorism. They were held despite a law requiring that suspects in criminal cases be automatically granted bail after being held for six months on remand. Early this month, Uganda's Chief Justice Alphonse Owini Dolo condemned the delayed prosecution of the two legislators and demanded that the state begin their trial, whether prepared or not. The Chief Justice warned the public prosecution office not to be an accomplice in denying anyone justice. The leader of the opposition in parliament, Mathias Simpuga, says the matter of the two legislators ceased to be a matter of prosecution, but persecution for their political views. They're out, they have temporary freedom. We can speak about now the future and how we, we shall be able to deal with the charges when they're out. The regime that I know, if they had coherent evidence, they would have loved to have a piece of his members. But the fact that for more than one and a half years, They've not been able to piece together evidence to have them tried. For me, it speaks to the fact that um, the charges were probably politically motivated. The charges were for their alleged involvement in killings that took place in Uganda's central districts of Rwengo and Masaka between March and June 2021. 26 people in all lost their lives, most of whom were elderly members of society killed using machetes. The bail applications for the two legislators were based on what their lawyers said were medical conditions that needed care, which prison facilities were not providing. Lawyer Samuel Muizi says both of the just-released legislators had to be rushed to hospitals to seek urgent medical attention. The Honorable Alan Sewanyana was ill, and uh, the Honorable Segirinya has been on and off, and there was no sufficient medical attention uh, as was required. So that is why the right thing to do immediately was to uh, take them to health facility and uh, a bit of uh, psychological care before they come out to the public. But Frank Waini, the Uganda prison spokesperson, told VOA that claims of ill treatment are just to undermine the government's image. Because they are beautiful lies, they started crying over the same since these guys came to prison. They have spent a year and they have gone back. If the systems were as bad as they are, their people wouldn't have made it through. So, but they can speculate and, and do political gimmicks over there. The legislators were granted bail on condition that they pay $5,460 and deposit their passports with the court. No trial debt has been set. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala, Uganda. There was a little drama in the Kenyan parliament yesterday, Tuesday, when two women members were kicked out for different reasons. Senator Karen Nyamu was told by the Speaker to leave the legislative chambers for wearing a sleeveless top, which the Speaker said was in violation of parliamentary rules. On the other hand, Senator Gloria Oroba was booted out of Parliament for wearing a white suit with a menstrual stain. She tells me that the incident has motivated her to advocate against what she calls period poverty. 
What happened is I had my period and I had an accident and there was a fellow senator who thought that it did not carry the dignity of the house to present myself with a stain on my trousers and so they asked for the speaker to invoke a standing order that was basically going to kick me out, which the speaker did not do. What he did is he basically said, we're giving you a chance to go and change and come back. I was reading the speaker asked you to go and uh, change into a decent outfit. What does that mean? It means that people must not know that you're having your period. And in the event that you have an accident, then you should find a way to cover it. That's the stigma which I'm trying to actually advocate against. When you say advocate against, are you doing something to change this? I have uh, come up with a motion to discuss, first of all, the issue on uh, period poverty because the lack of sanitary towels in many school-going children is what causes some of the incidences like, you know, staining your school uniform. So the motion is actually going to be on the floor of the house tomorrow. But I also have a bill that uh, is going to put a legal framework on uh, the provision of free sanitary towels to all school-going children and prisoners. Right now, there is a program that runs, but when you look at the Legal Amendment Act that is there, it doesn't really specify how frequent the provision of the sanitary towels is, the amount of sanitary towels that they get. It basically, um, it's all dependent on the goodwill of the government of the day. And what I'm trying to do is to put up a legal framework so that it doesn't matter which government comes in, but based on the constitution, that we have to provide free sanitary towels to all school-going children and prisoners. So, Senator, you were not the only person person kicked out of parliament on Tuesday. We understand that Senator Nyamu was also kicked out. What's happening to the women senators? No, it's not an, it's not an issue of the women senators. Uh, Senator Karen Nyamu actually was completely out of order because we have a dress code and you must not come with a sleeveless top. You have to cover your arms. The standing order actually gives a clear and straightforward uh, manner with which we have to dress. And when you look at how I was dressed, and that's why I was saying when I was called to the floor that I'm dressed based on the standing order. So there's no basis to actually say that, you know, your dress code is unethical or does not give the house the respect it deserves because what they were trying to do is actually period shame me. And people don't understand that stigma begins from small things like that. Has this happened before to male uh, senators or members of parliament? You know, what's funny actually is that the male uh, members of parliament is a bit forward, you know, shirt, tie, blazer. And then there was a time that they pushed to have traditional attire. And to be honest, we have a a male senator who actually comes dressed in the Maasai attire and he exposes his legs, he exposes his arms, but there's a justification around it basically saying that, you know, that's a traditional attire. In fact, the other day I was telling someone, if I had to come with my traditional attire from where I come from in Kisi County, then, you know, it would completely contradict the current standing order for women where we have to cover our arms, we have to cover our chest, we have to cover so and so. So I think also that's maybe an area that needs to be looked into. If we're all going to have official wear, we should all have official wear. If there is a level of allowance to have traditional attire, for instance, what Senator Karen Nyamu was wearing today, in some different places it could pass to be a traditional attire. Senator Gloria Aruba is a member of Kenya's parliament. She was speaking with us from Nairobi. The June 30 deadline is approaching for tens of thousands of holders of a Zimbabwean Exemption Permits, or ZEP, to transition to other permits or pack and leave South Africa. The Zimbabwe Community in South Africa NGO has warned the ZEP holders to watch out for permit scammers who have mushroomed all over the place. Claiming to be immigrant agents, these scammers are offering all kinds of permits to Zimbabweans desperate to remain in South Africa. Tuso Kumalo reports from Johannesburg. The June 30 deadline has given sleepless nights to up to 180,000 Zimbabweans. We have called South Africa their second home for more than a decade. Most have tried to apply for other permits only to find that they don't qualify. Zimbabwe Community in South Africa NGO Chairperson Roberto Mabena told VOA that this situation has given rise to a flurry of fly-by-night immigration agents who are offering all kinds of permits. The permit itself does not appear as fake because uh, the people at the Department of Home Affairs, they steal the sticker permits. 
uh, which they stick into one's passport. So the permit will not appear as fake from an ordinary eye. But the difference is that the details of that permit will not be entered into the system. Victress Matutu is the chairperson of the Zim Imbogodo, an NGO fighting for the rights of women and children. She told VOA that the permit scammers are out in full force. The ZEP holders are going around buying any available permits on the streets. So please, I'm begging you people, just stop buying those permits. If the ZEP comes to an end, that is it. You don't have to lose your money that you, you've worked hard for and buy a permit that is fake. Gretman Kwebu is a Zimbabwean national who has had this permit for over a decade. He told VOA that some people know the permits are fake but still get them out of desperation while others are simply conned. Anything coming along the way, Zimbabweans will try to make a plan to make a living. So my advice as I'm one of those people who apply those permits is for Zimbabweans to continue trying still with the Department of Home Affairs to apply even if they will not be successful but at least they they try something because all these bokas, uh, agents or whatever, they will keep on uh, exploiting people. And Mabena cautions that anyone caught with a fake permit risk jail time. The Department of Home Affairs has warned foreign nationals not to use agents in applying for residence permits, but instead go to VFS offices and apply in person if they are already in the country. Use of agents in facilitating permits application has long been banned in South Africa after it was giving rise to rampant corruption. Tuso Kumalo for VOA News, Johannesburg. Botswana's president, Mukwisi Matsisi, is threatening to walk away from a diamond mining deal with industry giant De Beers unless the firm offers better terms. Under the current deal, which expires in June, Botswana, Africa's largest diamond producer, is entitled to purchase up to 25% of the stones mined in joint venture. Analysts say Botswana is in a strong position to push for a 50-50 arrangement. Mkudise Dube reports from Habaruni, Botswana. Addressing ruling party supporters in his home village of Mushupa, just outside Habaruni, President Mukwetsi Masisi said his country is well positioned to push for a better deal with the beers. He says, we now know how the diamond industry operates. We used to receive 10% of the stake, but now under my leadership we are receiving 25%. Botswana currently earns about $4.5 billion per year in sales, taxes and royalties from its contract with De Beers. Masisi says if negotiations with the South African diamond company break down, then Botswana is prepared to pull out of the long-standing agreement. He says we are dealing with a giant. It is the first time it has been shaken like this. We want what is ours. This is our company. We want a majority stake and we are doing so through negotiations. If the talks become difficult, will say no, let everyone pack and go separate ways. It is unclear what other options Botswana might have, but a Belgian-based researcher on diamond mining, Hans Meket, says there could be an alternative. Meket notes President Masisi's praise for another supply arrangement between private diamond miner Lukara, which operates a mine in Botswana, and the Belgian-based buyer HP Antwerp. The two entered into an agreement which sees HB Antwerp purchase all of Lukara's large high-value diamonds. Botswana's President Masisi has regularly praised the business arrangement between HB Antwerp, a Belgian company, and uh, the Canadian diamond miner Lukara that operates the Karowe wine in Botswana. In the current arrangement with the beers, Botswana fears it is missing out on the profits from its diamonds because it has no idea for or control over how much value the country's rough diamond production generates further down the supply chain after it is cut and polished. Miket therefore suggests Botswana could be looking for a much more beneficial arrangement similar to Lukara and HB Antwerp's. The business model between HB Antwerp and Lukara closes this gap through a vertically integrated supply chain that allows all parties, including the government, to share in the profit from the final polished diamonds. The leader of Botswana's main opposition party, the Tabeluk Yorabetsi, recently told Parliament that the government needs to be more transparent with its mining deals. Mining agreements 
are not even available to the, were not even available to the Auditor General and are still not available for the Auditor General as they are considered to be confidential, especially for the Botswana or companies with partnership with Botswana government. Who then guards the guardians? Who scrutinizes these ag agreements? What is the role of parliament? A 10-year sales agreement between Botswana and TPS expired in 2021, but was extended to June 2023, pending negotiations. Mkondi Sidube for VOA News, Haboroni, Botswana. Ethiopia has long struggled with problems of communal friction turning into violent and ethnic conflict. Members of the two largest ethnic groups, the Oromos and Amharas, have come together to showcase traditional conflict resolution through musical drama. Maya Musiko reports from Adama, Ethiopia. One year ago, Bertukan Tadesa was fleeing war between Ethiopia's federal government and Tigrayan forces from her hometown in Wallo, Amhara region where she works as a dancer. With the November peace deal, she is back performing and using her skills to show traditional ways to resolve conflict peacefully between two main ethnic groups, the Amhara and Oromo. Our only difference is the language. We have seen them rehearsing yesterday and they have also seen ours. If you look through my family, there's an Oromo and there's an Amhara in theirs too. I don't know how it got so divided. The actors in this production demonstrate Abbagar, a customary Amhara way of managing conflict to stop tit-for-tat violence. With Abbagar, elders and women ask for forgiveness on behalf of offenders. Tasfahun Asafa is with Wallo's Habru Warada Communications Bureau. Currently, with the government unable to maintain peace and security, People are being adjudicated by the Abagar system. There are a lot of killings in our area, but once the Abagar is involved, that's it. It stops. Oromo actors perform their traditional Gada system, where the community's women call on elders to resolve conflict using the Sinke stick. Dima Abarra directs the Sinke drama. When people are fighting and the Sinke come in between, they must stop no matter what, even if it's murder. Afterwards, they're taken to the elders. The role of Sinke is vital in resolving conflict and protecting the rights of women. The Sinke stick is given from mother to daughter when she gets married to safeguard her rights as a wife. Mekia Jamal is director of the Oromo Cultural Center. We are doing a lot of important work with the Sinke in addressing conflicts across the country, and not just with this tradition, but using the Gara system, which is inseparable from the Sinke, to bring peace in the Oromia region as well as in other regions. Honoring traditional conflict resolution is key to peace, says artist laureate this shows the next generation that we can resolve conflict through discussion. The Ethiopian youth in this audience seem to agree. Maya Mzikir for VOA News, Adama, Ethiopia. February is Black or African American History Month here in the United States. The idea of Black History Month began February 1, 1926 as Negro History Week by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. It became a month-long celebration in 1976. 